good afternoon. I am John Graham, president of the Institute for Spirituality and Health, and I'm pleased to have you join us for the 29th Annual Psychotherapy and Faith Conference. I extend a warm welcome to each one of you, and along with our institute, our co-sponsors for this conference are the Menninger Clinic in Houston and Baylor College of Medicine. The Institute for Spirituality and Health was established in 1955, and we are now in our 65th year. Our mission is to enhance well-being by exploring the relationship that exists between spirituality and health. We fulfill our mission by holding conferences and lectures throughout the year and through research and service projects in our region. During COVID-19, we held more than a dozen online support groups and offered training in the management of stress for segments of our population, including healthcare providers, teachers, veterans, and during this long summer, for teenagers. Following the comments from our two co-sponsoring organizations, I will return to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Ken Pargaman. But first, Dr. Jim Lomax, who is a longtime member of our Board of Trustees at our Institute and was one of the founding members of this conference. Jim will extend a welcome to you, followed by Cynthia Mulder, who is at the Menninger Clinic. Jim. Thanks, John. It's wonderful to be here with you. Virtually is a lot better than not at all. And it's also great to see so many people on the screen who've been an important part of this conference in one way or another and an important part of my life through this conference. Uh, I'm somewhat representing Baylor College of Medicine today. I uh, still am at Baylor on a part-time uh, basis and still involved with how to help better uh, educate learners of all sorts to integrate psychotherapy and faith, as was the reason why Lois Wessendorf uh, came together with Bob Nelson and then John Fellers and then John Graham to uh, work on this conference. And it's her vision that we get to celebrate today, as well as the remarks from Ken Pargamon. So, We'll I'll turn it over to uh, Cynthia to, to Mulder from the Menninger Clinic. who will tell us more about things from the Menninger perspective and some of our uh, tasks today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lomax. Hi, my name is Cynthia Mulder, and I'm the Director of Education and Training here at the Menninger Clinic. And um, a few housekeeping notes before we begin the presentations. So as you can see, we're on a virtual platform and everybody is muted, but we will have some time after our first two presentations where we're gonna go into some small breakout rooms and um, you will be unmuted in that uh, space and then we will come back to the large group where you'll be muted again. If you have questions for our presenters or need any support, at the bottom of your screen, or it could be the top, if you hover, you should see the chat function. And in the chat function, you should see a sign that says support in all caps and host. And that is Stuart Nelson, who will be managing the questions and also helping to manage our time. So hopefully you can all find the chat and you can type in your questions at that, in that area. Uh, regarding continuing education credits, the continuing education certificates will be emailed you, to you this afternoon at about five o'clock. These uh, credits are awarded for 100% participation and no partial credits will be awarded. But at 5 p.m. you'll receive a survey and a certificate and you will also receive the slides from the presentation that day. We're waiting to send them to you at the end of the day so you can be fully present in our learning together. Please complete the survey and evaluation. We consider your feedback essential for all of our future programming and appreciate your thoughts. Regarding disclosures, uh, Dr. Graham has disclosed that he has a financial relationship by employment as he's the president and CEO of the Institute of Health. 
spirituality and health. He's also a member of the planning committee. Dr. Pargament receives research support from the John Templeton Foundation, and Dr. Lomax has no relevant financial relationships to disclose. So I have shared this with you verbally, and so on the evaluation, you can respond positively that you've been informed of that question. Um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Graham to introduce our first speaker. And again, on behalf of the Menninger Clinic, I wanna welcome you to this presentation and an important topic for us all today. Dr. Graham. Thank you, Cynthia. 10 years ago, with the encouragement of Dr. Jim Lomax, we invited professor of psychology from Bowling Green State University, Dr. Ken Pargaman, to come to Houston to give a series of lectures in the Texas Medical Center. The months that followed led to the Institute inviting Ken to become our first distinguished scholar. At our 2011 annual Psychotherapy and Faith Conference, Ken gave a presentation entitled, Attending to the Spiritual Dimension of Health, a perspective from 35 years of research and practice. Ken's outstanding talk on the impact that faith has on a person's health let us know he was an absolute winner. Not only did we appreciate Ken Pargament for his brilliant scholarship, we also found him to be a dear friend. At a dinner at the home of Bonnie and David Weekly, we gave Ken a Stetson cowboy hat and a Texas flag to let him know we hoped he would never leave Texas. Well, that didn't happen. But Ken did charm our board of trustees with his generous and kind words of appreciation. And it has been wonderful working with Ken over the years and getting to know his lovely wife, Aileen. The amazing thing to me is that during his tenure as a distinguished scholar, Ken gave many lectures in a variety of different settings. And always he had a unique and intriguing way to bring to focus what he wanted to say in his talks. None of us will ever forget his presentation on depression and spirituality. To everyone's delight, Ken used the story of the pessimistic, gloomy, and depressed friend of Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, to highlight his talks. We still remember that talk, Ken. Ken's two textbooks, are on my bookshelf, and we refer to them often. I also remember Kim sharing, Ken sharing his struggle as editor-in-chief of his two-volume APA Handbook of Psychology, Religion, and Spirituality. He was having great difficulty getting the authors to turn in their chapters. One day, Ken exclaimed, John, this is so exasperating. I will never again be editor of a book as long as I live. I don't know if that's happened, he can tell us. Today though, we are honored and delighted to have Ken with us as our keynote speaker. Ken's topic is entitled, From Brokenness to Wholeness, Repairing the Human Spirit in an Era of Upheaval. Please give a warm welcome and clap to our dear friend, Dr. Ken Pargolin. Thank you, John. Let me get myself operating here. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. Um, I was trying to describe the feelings that I, I have about being here right now. And a, a, as a child, um, my parents would occasionally ask all of the kids, how we were feeling. And I, I remember one time saying, I'm feeling sappy. And they said, sappy, what does that mean? I said, you know, sad and happy. And that's how I'm feeling now. It's a melancholy feeling. Um, I'm so happy to be able to be here with you and reconnect with my many dear friends from ISH and the Texas Medical Center um, and colleagues. I had 
wonderful experiences there and really treasure my relationships with you. Um, but I'm also uh, feeling some, not somewhat, but very sad about the dark times that we're all going through now. And uh, how you in Houston have been hit so hard by COVID. I hear Texas now has a million uh, cases of COVID. And I, I, I read stories about Houston hospitals and, and the healthcare professionals there. And it's touched me very deeply as I know you've been touched so deeply. But even so, uh, I'm so grateful uh, for the chance to see you again, albeit uh, virtually. It's not the ideal way of us getting together, uh, but as Jim Lomax, the language he uses, and I, I, really, I really appreciate, it's good enough. So let me, let me begin here. Um, it's customary when we see each other let me see if I can. Can I send me? Okay. Yeah, it's customer, customary when we meet each other to ask, how are you? And in the past, the, the question has been a pleasant formality, uh, often answered by, I'm fine, how are you? But no longer. Nowadays, how are you may be met by, I feel like I'm going crazy staying at home. I don't know what to do, I have to work but I don't want to send my children back to school in these conditions. My mother just tested positive for COVID, or I'm just so angry with the government. Pleasantries don't seem to have a place in the midst of a pandemic, a metaphorical plague. COVID-19 has um, threatened, shaken, and damaged us in many ways. Just consider this very partial list of stressors, fears of contracting COVID, concerns about the well being of loved ones, financial insecurity and loss, social disconnection and isolation, difficulty accessing health care, a whole variety of losses, including losses of the lives of loved ones, unacceptable conflicts that we faced, system systemic inequity and racism that COVID has revealed. And the stressors among healthcare workers have been even higher. In, in a national survey of healthcare workers, and this is late March, I believe things would be even worse now. 90% of healthcare providers worry about lack of protective equipment. 87% worry about not being able to get medical care. And 69% worry about their own risk of exposure at work. COVID has affected people on multiple levels. In terms of physical health, uh, the last I checked, there were over 235,000 deaths and counting in the US. Um, there are also the long haul effects of cardiac, pulmonary, and long-term neurological effects of COVID. Mental health effects include problems of anxiety and depression. 53% of Americans in March said COVID had it negatively impacted their mental health. 60% were feeling the worst is yet to come. And again, I believe those statistics would be even higher right now. Once again, we see healthcare workers, especially those working in emergency settings, showing more intense PTSD, anxiety, depression, anger, fear, and even stigma, fears from people in community about associating with uh, people who've been treating uh, and protecting the lives of individuals who've been infected by COVID. Other impacts are beginning to emerge. Increases in rates of addiction, increased rates of suicidality, at a, at a broader social level, socio-political conflicts, family violence and breakdown with people living in close quarters. And imagine living with close quarters with someone that you have uh, uh, some conflict that's been longstanding. It's a recipe for terrible problems. 
At the risk of sounding overly gloomy, I suspect these uh, physical, psychological, and social uh, effects will continue to ripple out, touching many people in many ways over many years. And I'd like to consider at least briefly the question of why should COVID have this kind of power? I mean, given everything we've just reviewed, you may say, well, the answer is obvious. But I think there's something implicit in the impacts of COVID rather than explicit. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that kind of implicit impact. COVID has shaken us to the core. It's touched us at our deepest levels. Here are a few ways to think about how we've been shaken to the core. In his classic book, Existential Psychotherapy, psychiatrist Irvin Yalom suggested that COVID, suggested that COVID might confront us with the givens of our existence, our ultimate concerns, our existential concerns, and trigger existential anxiety. Yalom focused on four of these concerns in his classic book. And I'm kind of extrapolating. Yalom, of course, didn't talk about COVID, but I believe his writings are quite relevant. I'd suggest that COVID has led to some profound anxiety and fear about death and the reality that there is no escape. So we're faced with questions of how do I come to terms with my own mortality, with the mortality of my loved ones? COVID has confronted us with the responsibility for our own choices and actions and presented us with some untenable choices. Do I go to work and face the risk of COVID or do I stay home and face economic problems and, and, uh, and, and stress? COVID raises issues about our isolation and our anxiety associated with our fundamental isolation in the world. We're faced with more isolation and disconnection of people than I think many of us have ever had in our lives. How do we come to terms with that? And COVID confronts us with the possibility that we live in an indifferent universe, that the universe may in fact be chaotic. Certainly it feels as if things have been pretty chaotic over the last uh, eight months. And I might add an additional existential challenge to Yalom's list, and that's the encounter with unfairness and injustice in the world. How do we come to terms with the fundamental unfairness and inequity that's been revealed by COVID? Yalom notes that many people try to avoid these concerns rather than face their existential anxiety, they avoid it. And we see these avoidant defense mechanisms very much on display right now. We have people denying that COVID is a significant issue. It's been called a hoax. We have people engaging in magical thinking that somehow COVID will simply poof, magically disappear or go away. We have leaders of religious communities and they can be found in every, every major religious tradition engaging in what, what I've called religious deferral, deferral of control of COVID to God. And we have leaders encouraging their members to attend religious services in person and ceremonies and rituals telling them that God will spare them from infection. And we have people engaged in externalization, placing the blame on COVID, uh, for COVID on outside forces or outside individuals. And here we have some, all kinds of conspiracy theories, which all serve to enable the individual to refuse taking any responsibility for actions to mitigate the impact of the virus. But these defense mechanisms are not likely to be effective because no matter how we try to avoid it, COVID is insistent. 
and people will run into the realities of contracting the virus, not just themselves, but family, family members and friends and colleagues. Now, a second way to think about how we've been shaken to the core comes from the work of uh, Ronnie Janoff Bullman. In her, her classic book, Shattered Assumption Toward a New Psychology of Trauma, she coined the term assumptive worlds to describe the fundamental assumptions and beliefs and values and the dreams for the future that we strive towards. I, I've called this our orienting system. Our assumptive worlds or orienting system allow us to navigate through the perils and pitfalls of life while maintaining our emotional equilibrium. The power of trauma, John F. Bowman maintains, lies in its ability to, to shake and even shatter our assumptive worlds. And as a result, we can lose our guiding compass. We lose our, our balance, we become disoriented, and we have a difficult time finding our purpose or finding the pathways to reach our destinations, whatever that purpose in life may be. I'd say that Janoff Bowman's description of shattered assumptions or disorientation is very relevant to where many people are finding themselves or are about to find themselves as the pandemic uh, reaches out, ripples out to touch more and more people's lives. Now, as important as the work of, ja of Yalom and Janif Bowman Wortman is, Janice Bo uh, Bowman, uh, Ronnie uh, Janif Bowman is, I think they've neglected a way in which we've been shaken to the core. We've been shaken not only physically, psychologically, and socially. We've also been shaken spiritually. COVID has raised profound tensions and questions and conflicts about what we hold most sacred. Um, we call these conflicts spiritual struggles. Julie Exline, my wonderful colleague, uh, and I described these struggles and their implications for clinical practice in a forthcoming book entitled, appropriately enough, Shaken to the Core, Spiritual Struggles in Research and Clinical Practice. Uh, Julie and I identified six types of spiritual struggle. And take a look at them. I think each of them has at least some relevance for how many people are now, what many people are now experiencing in this time of upheaval. Divine struggles, feeling angry at God, feeling punished by God or abandoned by God, feeling unloved by God. Demonic struggles, feeling that we're being attacked by or torment, tormented by a devil, evil spirits, or just some impersonal evil force that's been unleashed now in the world. Doubt-related struggles, Fundamental questions and doubts and confusion about the religious beliefs and tenets that we've lived by. Moral struggles, wrestling with attempts to follow our higher principles, particularly in a context nowadays that makes it very difficult to live by our higher principles. Struggles of ultimate meaning, trying to find some purpose in one's own life and in the world more generally in the midst of this terrible plague. And interpersonal struggles, conflicts with other people and institutions about sacred issues. Trauma, we believe, may create part of its destructive effects in part because it does shake, shake people to the core. And by that, I mean spiritually. Uh, Julie Pomerleau, one of my great graduate students, 
and I conducted a study that illustrates this point. And this is the most uh, uh, statistically oriented slide I'm going to show you. So don't be frightened when you see it. I'll try to explain it. It's very scary, though. OK, here you go. OK, this is structural equation modeling. And what we found was in the results of a study of a national sample of, of adults in the US. And what we found was that stressful life events, people who've been exposed to more stressful life events, were more likely to show poor positive adjustment and greater negative adjustment. Now, that's a, a well-established finding. So there's nothing really new about that. But what we added here was that the effects of trauma on mental health were mediated by spiritual struggles. So you can see that line from stressful life events to RS struggles towards the top of the slide. And then another line from RS struggles to positive adjustment and negative adjustment. People who experienced more spiritual struggles following life crises were the ones who are at greatest risk for mental health problems. Let me say that again. People who experienced more spiritual struggles following life crises were the ones who were at greatest risk for mental health problems. I think this is an important finding for practitioners. Mental health problems don't inevitably or invariably follow trauma. We know some people are resilient and they're able to withstand, um, sustain themselves, and in some cases, even grow and transform through trauma. Whether major life stressors lead to serious problems depends at least in part on whether the traumas result in spiritual struggles. This has an important practical implication. Um, when providers are working with people who've been traumatized, they need to ask the additional question of how the trauma has impacted them spiritually. And if the individual has been impacted spiritually by the trauma, if the individual is struggling spiritually, that's a red flag. And that suggests those struggles need to be taken seriously in treatment. Now, it seems pretty clear to me that COVID has shaken not only the people we care for, it's shaken us as well as healthcare professionals. We've not been immune. It's shaken many of us to our core. And in fact, I think we're particularly vulnerable because we're forced to confront our own existential concerns. Our own assumptive worlds have been shaken and we're facing our own spiritual struggles. I came across the example of Latanya Rafe, a nurse working at Acres Homes, uh, reported in the Houston Chronicle in August of this year. And I was struck by the title of the article. The title was, I am so, so tired. She described her experience with one of her favorite patients, a Hispanic man in his 60s, who was unable to be with his family in the hospital. He spoke no English and she spoke no Spanish. But she tried to find Spanish music for him on YouTube to comfort him. When his vital signs took a sharp plunge downward, she stayed with him stroking his hand. And that's how she could communicate. But she reached the limits of what she could do. And so she said, friend, I brought you as far as I can, as far as I can take you. It's okay to let go. On a daily basis, uh, Latanya had to let go of the hopes of saving many of her patients. And it's clear from the article the toll that it had taken on her as well. We've been shaken to our core and many of us are feeling a sense of brokenness and woundedness. COVID has revealed underlying cracks and fissures and rifts within ourselves, in our relationships and in our world. As we eagerly, even desperately, await a vaccine, 
much of our work now as healthcare professionals and mental health care providers in particular is crisis intervention, helping people regain their equilibrium and ride out this stormy period. I don't think our job will end though with crisis intervention. In fact, I'd like to suggest that that's likely to be just the beginning. With time, I think it will become increasingly important to be able to help people whose worlds have been shaken and repair their deeper existential and spiritual wounds and move from brokenness to greater wholeness. Now, how do we do that in the context of mental health care? I don't have really good answers now. I've been thinking about this question for, for months, but I'd like to spend uh, the rest of my time sharing some thoughts. And then I hope uh, later in our time together, you can share some of your thoughts with us as well. One way to repair the human spirit, I believe, is by encouraging a deeper conversation. To repair the human spirit, we'll need to go beyond our usual focus on presenting problems and clinical concerns, as necessary and as important as they are. We'll need to take a deeper dive into the existential and spiritual questions and conflicts and struggles that are likely in this time of upheaval. Now, this is not an easy task, given our natural human tendencies to try to ameliorate pain and suffering. But I believe we can't afford to simply avoid the deeper impact of COVID. We can encourage a deeper conversation by asking deeper questions that open the door to reflection on the struggles that can arise. I call these psycho-spiritual questions because though they don't explicitly mention matters of faith, divinity, or the sacred, they're deeply meaningful questions that hold spiritual connotations. So let me share at least a few of them with you. What are the deepest questions your situation has raised for you? What causes you the greatest despair and suffering? How has this experience changed you at your deepest levels? What have you discovered about yourself that you find most disturbing? How has this situation shaken your faith? What, is this what has this experience taught you that you wish you had never known? What are your deepest regrets? These questions, again, are difficult questions. And yet I believe they're necessary questions if we're going to help people appreciate and understand and eventually come to terms with the ways they have been shaken to the core. And as important as asking questions is, it's just as important to listen for the struggles that may underlie the presenting issues of clients, their depression, their anxiety, psychosomatic symptoms, accomplished with family, guilt, and so on. Um, as Theodore Reich had written about many years ago, we need to listen with a third ear for the deeper dimension of our clients' concerns. A second uh, way to engage and repair the human spirit, I believe, will involve the importance of creating ritual. One of the most important functions of religion lies in its ability to help people negotiate and navigate their way through critical life transitions. Every major religious tradition provides its adherents with rites of passage um, that mark the beginning of life, the transition from childhood to adulthood, the joining of two individuals to make a marital unit, and the transition from life to death. These are, in the words of Edwin Friedman, hinges of time, doors, that swing open to reveal a deeper transcendent dimension to our days on earth. Rites of passage serve a number of critical purposes. Consider a funeral. The funeral marks in a public way the reality that something momentous has occurred and confront people with that reality. 
The funeral lets people in the larger community know that there's been a shift in roles and the status of people. The living now become the departed and the mourners now become, the, the survivors now become mourners. The, fun the funeral provides ongoing love and support to mourners. They're reminded that even though something momentous has taken place, they continue to be surrounded by love and care and they'll continue to be there for them, providing stability in the midst of profound change. Now, part of the terrible uh, power of COVID is its impact on the rites of passage that have sustained us through difficult periods of transition. We can't get together for baptisms and uh, confirmations and bar and bat mitzvahs and weddings and funerals. And yeah, we can do our Zoom rituals. Uh, but in some ways, I believe the momentous events are still going un not fully acknowledged or ritualized. We sorely need new creative rituals to take the place of those we've lost, even if they're not as satisfying. I was struck by the informal ritual that took place in New York City at the height of the pandemic there, when every day in the late afternoon, when people were getting off of or going into work, people went onto their balconies and clapped for the heroic workers. And when the pandemic passes, we'll need local, national, even global rituals that mark what we've lost. Maybe a global day of mourning. Maybe monuments and symbols of this terrible time. And maybe celebrations of the heroic individuals who've helped guide us through this time at such personal risk. I hope we can all give this more thought. A third way to repair the human spirit, cultivating sacred moments. You've probably heard the term vicarious traumatization and the idea that we can be traumatized ourselves by listening to the pain and suffering of those we help. I'm sure you've experienced vicarious traumatization in your own clinical work. But I believe it's also possible to experience vicarious inspiration by experiencing sacred moments in our work with others. Let me give an example. Before COVID-19 um, hit the United States, I was giving some talks about sacred moments to hospice care staff and uh, workers, residents in Duluth, Minnesota. I asked people to share a sacred moment with each other in small groups. And I recall one very elderly man was sitting with his wife in a group and apologized to the others before he spoke, saying, I may lose track of my thoughts here. You see, I'm losing my mind. I mean, literally, the dementia has set in. But I have sacred moments with my wife. Just look at her. His wife was sitting next to him and her eyes were filled with love and sorrow. Her eyes never left his. He said, she brings me sacred moments every day. And then he said, this is the worst time of my life. And after a pause, he said, this is the best time of my life. Our group sat hushed feeling the sacredness of what he had shared with us. Sacred moments are what make life worthwhile. They're what we most treasure. They're transcendent. They're timeless and boundless. They reveal to us what life is truly about. They're marked by deep feelings of connectedness, where we feel like we see into the soul of others and they see into, into our souls. And they elicit profound spiritual emotions of awe, added, uh, uplift, gratitude. There are un-PTSD moments seared into our hearts and souls as our PTSD experiences, but in a positive, life-transforming way. The sacred moments we experience are what sustain us through our dark times. With my great collaborators, Jim Lomax and Serena Wong, we've been doing studies of sacred moments. 
and we can share publications on the topic if you're interested. They speak to the power of sacred moments in facilitating well-being. Here I'd like to share a sacred moment of our own with you, if you're willing to do this. It's just a couple minute reflection. So settle into your chair with your hands resting comfortably and your feet touching the floor. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so and settle your gaze into on, on a space otherwise that's close to you. Picture a treasure chest in your mind. See if you can envision the chest, this sealed storage box that contains your most treasured memories. Now imagine opening your box. Here are your life's most treasured moments collected in one place. Think of them as snapshots or moving pictures. You begin sifting through your chest of memories. And as you move through your memories, see if you can find one sacred moment. Maybe you experienced it with another person maybe outdoors, maybe in response to a piece of music, maybe in something seemingly ordinary. In any case, it's a moment in time that feels set apart from the others when you connected with something greater than yourself. Maybe it's a moment that lifted you up, a moment that feels timeless, a moment that opened your heart to something really real, a moment of deep connection Perhaps as you hold this moment, the edges of it even glow. Imagine the essence of this moment washing over you and into you, warmly enveloping you into this sacred memory, drawing you into the sacred moment. Perhaps you're wholly absorbed into the scene. Breathe in the sacred moment and draw what you need from it, comfort, gratefulness, love. Take in all that you need and sit with it for a moment. Now that you've been filled by this moment, allow yourself to let go of it until next time. It will always be there for you. You can return to your treasure chest anytime. Now gently turn your attention into the room, into the present, and when you feel ready, open your eyes. Sacred moments help us shift from ordinary experience to extraordinary experience. But what makes sacred moments extraordinary is their location in the everyday. Sacred moments, the ordinary becomes remarkable. In this vein, a Buddhist monk once said that the miracle is not so much in walking on water, but walking on earth. One final thought about ways to repair the human spirit, fostering a hopeful guiding spirit. When we're feeling hopeless, religious and spiritual resources can be important sources of an ultimately hopeful guiding vision that can sustain us through difficult times and help us let go of the pain and propel us into a newly envisioned future. In a recent study I did with some colleagues, we found that at low levels of hope, when people are feeling most hopeless, those who are able to make use of positive religious coping resources experience greater well being. Now, in spite of their differences, the world religious traditions share in providing their adherents with an ultimately hopeful guiding vision. I'll just present here some examples from the different religions of the world. For instance, in Christianity, we hear the fruit of the spirit will cast out fear. In Islam, we hear perfect happiness, peace and freedom from fear will present in paradise. And in Buddhism, we hear that acting compassionate toward others will bring peace and tranquility. These hopeful sentiments are sources of positive emotions that have been linked to positive effects on the immune system and other physical 
and mental health benefits. And hopeful, hopeful guiding visions can be found in non-traditional spiritual writings as well. Uh, following the death of Martin Luther King Jr., Robert F. Kennedy drew on the words of an Athenian philosopher from the fifth century BCE who said, in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Let me conclude with one hopeful vision I particularly like. It's an image based on uh, a Japanese philosophy and art form called Kintsugi. Kintsugi involves breaking pieces of pottery apart and then putting it together again with gold or silver or filigree. It's seen as a metaphor for our lives. We're all broken in part. And part of the art of living involves putting together the pieces of life and making something whole out of brokenness. And that process can create something more beautiful than the unbroken work of art. We can help each other put our broken pieces together. And sometimes we can even share our broken pieces with each other. And this is a very hopeful metaphor for clients, uh, particularly those who feel broken beyond repair, people with PTSD, intractable depression, and so on. My clients, I have often showed works of Kintsugi in my office. One of my clients sent me a thank you note several months after we terminated treatment, and he addressed it to Dr. Kentsugi Pargament. I, I took that as very high praise. So I've shared some of my thoughts about how to repair the human spirit in this time of upheaval. I wish I had more definitive answers to offer you, but we're all in the midst of a terrible storm. And we're gonna to have to work together to find our way to more peaceful water and hopefully a world transformed. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to, pe how to help people struggling with their shaken worlds. And I, I'd like to leave you with this question to think about as we move into breakout sessions after John Graham's talk. And the question I have for you to consider is what is the greatest challenge you're facing and how are you trying to deal with it? Okay, well, at this point then, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. John Graham, our next speaker. And it's a pleasure for me to do so. Um, John, as many of you know, is, is both a distinguished physician and an Episcopal priest. He's been president and CEO of the Institute for Spirituality and Health since 2010. And I could go on listing his remarkable accomplishments, but I think that would be embarrassing for, for John. John is an exceptionally humble and gracious man um, who treats others with kindness and compassion and sensitivity. Um, during my visits to uh, the uh, ISH, um, John and his wonderful wife, Pat, um, introduced me to the Texas bluebells, um, Texas sized pancakes, and a Texas cowboy hat and boots, which I continue to wear and treasure. As a matter of fact, I keep it in my office. There you go. <laughs> I asked my sons when I brought it home the first time, and they said, I said, what do I, do I look like a real Texas cowboy? And they said, no, dad. <laughs> so let me now welcome uh, with pleasure our next speaker, Dr. John Graham. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate so much your kind words. <clears throat> Life has certainly been difficult for almost everyone during COVID-19. But I have to believe that life has been doubly difficult for those who have lost a loved one during this crisis. Over the years, both as a physician and an Episcopal priest and as at the Institute, having facilitated a weekly bereavement support group for the last eight years, 
I, like many of you, have witnessed the pain of family experiences with the loss of a loved one, whether a spouse or a child or a parent or a lifelong partner. During the last eight months, we have met, our bereavement group has met online, and many have shared with tears that their loved one died in the ICU and that they could not be present at the time of their death. They grieve not being able to hold the hand of their loved one, to kiss her or him, to say their goodbyes. And those who are grieving often were not able to hold a memorial service, one of those rituals that Ken talked so much about. They were not able to hold a memorial service to celebrate the life of their loved one. They could not invite friends to come to their church or synagogue or mosque or temple to be present and support them with tears and a warm embrace. Instead, they have had to stay at home, often alone, without family and friends. COVID-19 has changed our life. It's also changed the way we die. And it has been a difficult time for all of us that must serve in this arena. And I believe doubly difficult for those who are the bereaved. I thought uh, as a priest, we always like to start with a joke. So I thought I would start with some sort of joke. I hope y'all can see that. Can you see it? Okay. All right. I assume. And this, of course, is from the pearls of before swine. And uh oh, let's see if I can go back. And it says, Why are you, what you're so happy about, pig? And pig says, I'm not. Then why are you smiling? I'm fooling myself. That makes life so much easier, said Rat. And I love Rat and his comments. I, I just think we have had, in many ways, to fool ourselves because of the dire situation that we have been facing globally. Never has happened before in all of human history. And I want you to know it's important for us to remember the loss of a loved one affects the whole person physically, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. So if we happen to be clergy, we may focus on the spiritual dimension, but we cannot forget the physical, psychological, emotional. And if we're a psychiatrist or a mental health worker, we cannot forget the physical. And I really want to emphasize that, that every loved one who is, every faculty, a family member who has lost a loved one must have a physician taking care of them because the sympathetic nervous system has responded to the danger it's either real or perceived in their life with the fight or flight response. And the loss is often emotionally devastating. The future for the person is suddenly uncertain and hopes and dreams have been dashed. And I'm thinking of a woman who lost her son and expected at 21, expecting him to get married and go to college and have children. It was her only child. And sudden death is not uncommon for those who've lost a loved one. So it is a serious situation and we should be well aware of it and not forget it. If it's prolonged grief, it's sustaining the classic stress response with cortisol pouring out from the adrenals, blood sugar, insulin, cholesterol elevated, the immune response is depressed, and the consequences are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, infections, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and even early death if untreated. What is the value Oops. What is the value of a support group? I think this is important for us to realize, and that is that family and friends will listen to a person who's bereaved for about two months, 
and then they try to fix them. They'll say things like, it's time to move on with your life. They don't even want them mentioning the name of the deceased person, even if it was their spouse. They tell me this in bereavement group, and they hear them saying things like, your loved one is in a better place. Oh, really? That's very comforting. How about God needed her more than you do? Not likely to be very kind and considerate, but it's in the anxiety of the situation that family and friends say these things. In our group, the members are like-minded. They've all lost someone. They do not try. We tell them right at the beginning of every meeting, we're not going to try to fix you. And our people then listen. We are taught to listen almost as a witness with understanding as this person shares their pain and their losses. And by the way, it's not just loss of companionship of the one person that died. It's everything from distant relatives showing up that never showed up, but now they come to see if they can reap a reward, maybe take a picture off the wall of your home because you're so numb you can't respond to it. And your best friends stop calling because maybe they saw you as a couple and maybe they don't want to hear about the pain anymore. Financial support may be lost. And you're living perhaps in an empty home, dealing with paying of bills, legal matters, repairs that you never had to take care of, or making decisions all alone. And then there's always the empty seat at the dinner table and sharing in a loving atmosphere as a support group is very healing. I want you to know that and I hope you don't forget it. A support group offers a safe place to share anger. People have said, I'm so angry my husband didn't take care of himself. Very angry. The doctor missed my wife's diagnosis. This man actually wanted to go kill the doctor. His, his relatives took all the guns away and he was receiving psychiatric counseling. He softened over a year's period of time, went to his wife's grave every single day and eventually reconciled with her loss. I've heard the ambulance driver is too slow. I've heard the hospital discharge my, pay, my, my relative too soon. And a safe place is also a place to share guilt and shame. All the what ifs that come up, and we hear them every day, such as, if only I had, had, a, had not had a fight with my daughter before she died. And with tears, this woman shared this. So we, all we need to think about the coping strategies that humankind have. I'm always amazed by the resilience of humankind. We really have strategies if we can get in touch with them. Studies have shown it's how we respond to stress that is the single most important factor to our recovery. Hans Selye said that the impact of stress on our health depends on how we perceive it. And Viktor Frankl taught our uh, attitude directly impacts how stress will affect us. At our institute, we teach self-care mind-body practices to manage stress, like soft belly breathing, taking a deep, deep breath with our abdomen, then our chest, and letting out slowly. We teach meditation, mindfulness classes, exercise and movement practices, the guided meditation that can help a person reconstruct in a way a more healthy picture of their life situation. We talk about journaling and drawing, and we have yoga, tai chi, and jikong classes, which are very important. But faith and religious practices can be vital to recovery for many people. We know these, of course, prayer, forgiveness, a worship situation, attending perhaps a retreat, being counseled with clergy, and reading sacred writings of our own tradition, such as the one at the bottom. May the God of all comfort comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
There are spiritual assessment tools, many of them available. I want to focus on the one Ken Pargament has gifted us with called the brief. The R word stands for religious cope, for R cope. It's a 14 item measure. It actually started out, I believe, 107 items and was brought down with statistical analysis to 75 and then finally to 14 measures of religious coping with major stress stressors, life stressors. And it's contributed to our better understanding of the roles that religion plays when people are dealing with crisis, trauma, or when they have to go through a transition in life. And I want to tell you, in bereavement, all three of those apply. They're in a crisis, they've experienced a serious trauma, and they are going through a transition. Individuals approach these kind of situations either with an adaptive, positive approach or mindset, or they are maladaptive and negative. The R COPE spiritual inventory identified five roles or functions of religion. I think it's good for us to remember this in our rather secular age and when we think we can dismiss with religion and so many are doing that and many younger generation particularly. But look at these five, meaning, gaining control for comfort and closeness to God, religion functions for intimacy and for life transformation. Looking at meaning, it's appraisal of God as a benevolent God, which would be a positive approach. Or we could look at it negatively as God is being a punishing God. And then as far as gaining control, we actively can surrender our life situation to God in a very positive way or be passively deferral. Ken talked about passively deferring a situation which is not positive. As far as comfort and closeness, we can be spiritually connected with God and our faith systems, our religions help us do that, or we can remain disconnected from God. And then there's intimacy with clergy and with members of our religious setting. Pat and I have to go online every Sunday, but we have a wonderful time at the end of the service in which we're all on there and we talk to each other. And reflect on each other's situation. But so you didn't have that. You were disconnected from clergy and members of any religious organization. And then life transformation moments, seeking religious conversion to find peace instead of holding on to anger, hurt, and fear. I think these are beautiful contributions to what religion has brought to many of us, and it is helpful to know that and remember it. As far as spiritual health, for many, religion and faith is a source of comfort and solace. We receive reassurance, guidance, strength, hope, intimacy with God. And studies shows that these have lower psychopathology. They have a higher sense of well-being. And they will actively pursue God in solving life problems. And there are psychological and health benefits to being spiritually healthy. In Ken Pargament's R. Cope, there are seven positive religious responses. I want to read a couple of them at least. Individuals can, in a positive way, say they have looked for God, stronger connection with God. And by the way, there are seven in this, of the 14 items in the R. Cope. They could respond, I have sought God's love and care. They could respond, I've sought help from God in letting go of my anger, or that I've tried to put my plans into action together with God. I've added, this is having a partnership with God and trying to see how God might be trying to strengthen me through this situation and asking forgiveness for my failings. And finally, focusing on religion to stop worrying about my current problems. But what about spiritual struggles? Many experience their relationship with God and religion quite differently. 
God seems distant, unresponsive, or perhaps God is even punishing or vengeful. And we'll often question if God cares or is powerful enough to change anything, or if God even exists. And some feel angry towards God for abandoning them or causing their stress. Adverse effects occur psychologically and physically as far as health is concerned with anxiety and depression often for these individuals. And here are the seven negative religious responses in our cope. And I might recommend it to you to study it. There's the, at the bottom of the page, there is the, the, the reference in the literature where you can read all about it in a wonderful article, about 20 pages, long article, 25 pages. A negative response might wonder whether God has abandoned them or felt punished by God for a lack of devotion. Wondered what I did for God to be punishing me and questioning God's love for me. Wonder whether my church has abandoned, abandoned me. And that really can happen quite often. I want to, you could almost circle number 12. I've been through several church, Pat and I, where our situation in church was unpleasant and you can be, have a bad experience. And then the 13 decided to the devil made this happen as Ken mentioned earlier and questioning the very power of God in life situations. I want to finally mention some of the ways to respond. I love what Ken did as he encouraged deeper conversations and the questions he brought up that, are, that he gave us. I want to just suggest a few, and like him, I would say we all have something to contribute. Certainly listening respectfully to one, a person struggling with existential matters concerning God, being mindful, they really are probably experiencing deep existential pain they don't even want to share, don't feel safe to share. So we have to build trust, affirming the client's logic and their, even their reasoning where possible. And almost always it is possible to do that. And then we can ask those open-ended questions like Ken mentioned. This one I love, in the past, in difficult times, where did you find strength to carry on? The wonderful thing about these questions, they don't mention religion or God by name, but it gives people the opportunity to say, well, in the past, maybe before the church rejected me, I really had a, found my strength in a church or synagogue or mosque or temple setting. So I can maybe even draw on that now, perhaps. And when you feel the person is ready, you can inquire about a pathway to go forward. And the patient is, or individual needs to choose their own path. We don't give it to them. And I would recommend always not forgetting the areas of self-care that medicine has taught us. Exercise, sleep, having good night's sleep, good nutrition, not using tobacco, moderate alcohol intake. And by the way, these two things are important, the last two, because when they go through a stressful time, people can go back on tobacco and can begin to drink heavily, as you know. So it needs to be brought up and even questioned at the right time. And then find out about social interaction. And if they don't have any, you might be able to suggest walking in the neighborhood you see people, even neighbors that you know, walk mindfully, even looking at the roses, the flowers, the house, the new house being built. Attend a book club, take a yoga, a tai chi swimming class, or maybe mindfulness self-compassion class. These are all healthy ways to have social interaction with a new group of people. And finally, consider recommending a bereavement support group. I highly recommend it. I found it to be the most special sacred moment for me of every week is being with that precious group of people, some 15 to 20 every week, who are shedding their tears, but also laughing together at the right moments. 
Uh, I want to show you this, um, which looks at the prevalence and effectiveness of stress management in closing. I want to look at this. Many people said music would be a great way to manage my stress, about 48% of them. And about 50% of those who did it said, yeah, it worked. About exercise, many, about 43% mentioned it's good to take a walk. And those that do it, about 62% said it was very helpful. And finally, I wanted you to see this. Only about 30% in this particular study said, well, in stressful times, I pray. But those who prayed, 73% said it was very meaningful and effective. And what about going to church or religious service? Only about 20% said they did, but 77% found that to be powerful in their life. And look down the list below that, playing sports, getting a massage, meditating, or going to a mental health professional. The number that do it diminished all the way to 5% for a mental health professional in this study, but look at how they were positive. They had 68% response or higher, all of these on the, in the right margin. And I think we need to remember that and be able to share it with those that are hurting and don't have, know the next pathway they should take to, to better their lives at the right moment. These are good things to remember and recall. Finally, I wanna close with this anonymous poem that we read in our group. If I don't read it, they'll ask me to read it because it brings such comfort to the bereaved. It says, grief never ends, but it changes. It's a passage, not a place to stay. It's not a sign of weakness or lack of faith. Grief is the price of love. And I truly believe it because I've seen it in the face of my bereavement group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Graham and Dr. Pargament. And what a way to, uh, what a moving way to end on, um, on that poem. And so what we would like to do now is we're going to, uh, the Zoom is gonna automatically break people into small groups. And we would like you to think about these two questions. What is the greatest COVID-19 related challenge you are currently facing and how are you trying to deal with it? And then another question is, have you experienced a client who feels God has been unjust? And what would you say to that person? Okay, welcome back from your small groups. I hope that that um, offered an opportunity for connection and uh, sharing and community. And um, uh, even in a virtual way, a bit more um, uh, connection, uh, which I think we are all craving in this, in this world. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next uh, speaker and um, really is, is a huge honor for me to introduce Dr. Jim Lomax. And uh, Dr. Lomax is the Carl Menninger Chair of Psychiatric Education and the former Associate Chairman and Director of Educational Programs in the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Baylor College of Medicine. He has chaired, as Dr. Graham mentioned, the planning committee for the annual Psychotherapy and Faith Conference for more than 25 years. And he received the 2016 Oscar Pfister Award from the American Psychiatric Association, Association for Important Contributions to Humanistic and Spiritual Aspects of Psychiatric Issues. And um, I have a special uh, relationship with Dr. Lomax as a, uh, my analytic supervisor and a collaborator on uh, many cases that I have just found his wisdom, his warmth, and his uh, um, support invaluable. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Lomax, 
who is going to bring some reflections and translations from our experience into clinical practice. Thank you, Cynthia. It's a pleasure to get to be with all of you again, see people who I've had long and wonderful relationships with on the video. I am going to tell two clinical stories about the consequences of social isolation or what Ken referred to as dislocation. You'll become aware that these are very different stories in some ways, but they share in the having involving efforts to respond to loss of typical venues of, uh, for human connectedness. Um, the stories will be very real, actually happened uh, with my people, my patients, but I'm gonna be intentionally misidentifying them to protect their privacy and confidentiality. So uh, as you listen to it, don't try to figure out who the people are or might be, just listen to the story. I'm gonna begin with someone I'm gonna call Dr. Smith, who is a 65-year-old Hispanic widowed but remarried female patient of mine who first started to see me about 10 years ago after her husband, a retired police officer, was diagnosed with acute myelocytic leukemia, a illness with a very known, very high, often rapid course mortality. She was aware from a previous psychotherapy earlier in her, her life that she was prone to depression after loss. And in fact, her husband did die uh, less than a year after we began to meet somewhat near the anniversary, paradoxically, of their wedding several decades before. Our early work helped her to persevere through the husband's really painful and agonizing death and slowly to start make new connections uh, complicated by various parts of the, 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 the family story that was related to her and her husband's marriage. Um, and then she began rather intense and sometimes almost frantic uh, efforts to find a new life partner. She really loved connectedness and had a wonderful marriage and was uh, wanting to find somebody else. As we were talking about these things, however, we also confronted her uh, intense efforts to what she referred to as adopt needy children, which was a metaphor for her. And with these uh, people who she would find, she would give to them intentionally in a kind of unconditional way, that's what her model was, and without any explicit discussions of reciprocity. Now, unfortunately, these efforts, noble in a sense, uh, often left her filled with resentful disappointments and regrets. Uh, what we, about a part of her, which we constructed together as her characterological excess of transcendence. And you'll be hearing some of Robert Cloninger's uh, language from previous presentations in these discussions. So after some uh, most unfortunate attempts at trying to develop relationships with quite charming but quite exploitative males, she did meet and develop a long, loving, quite rela reciprocal relationship with a very nice widowed man that she met and then married. But then COVID hit uh, this year. The social isolation that was produced for her age group, and she did have a couple of uh, comorbid conditions, left her urges to be involved in giving relationships really thwarted. We worked together on her urges to uh, give to these variety of, uh, quote, adoptive children, but with more explicit expectations and then to reconnect with relatives in her family who, with whom she had lost connection because of similar disappointments when she was giving to these relatives and they, instead of being reciprocal, became exploitative. One thing I learned during COVID was that I neglected to inquire about her involvement in Facebook activities. 
Unfortunately, Facebook both reflected her admiration for her deceased husband's police service uh, and also left her vulnerable to what has become in this past uh, few years increasingly sophisticated social media exploitations. And this has happened with this patient, it's happened with one other patient of mine, and it's happened with some friends and uh, dear colleagues of mine, analogous things. So we were working together, and but a couple of months ago, she sort of confessed to me with really vitriolic, angry self-depreciation that she had, in her words, stupidly let herself be fraudulently exploited. She went on to tell me an elaborate uh, uh, story of a desperate police officer she had found on Facebook who was widowed like her and caught up, had had, she had been, and caught up in a distant state in really horrible portrayed circumstances. He slowly appealed to her compassion and then further describe these desperate situations that his children were in in other states. Uh, these such stories like this are actually quite typical of such scams, although I have learned this, and <coughs> uh, frequently accompanied with compelling data, pictures, tragic stories, and information that comes from the uh, email accounts of the person who is being exploited. Uh, so she was slowly becoming suspicious, but then after she initially responded with some small gifts to him, he started making larger and larger and ultimately just outrageous requests. I'm afraid my computer, my printer is going off in the background and you may hear some of that, but uh, I don't think I can stop it. Uh, <clears throat> she had been too embarrassed to discuss these occurrences with me. Uh, and of course, with her uh, very nice husband that she had worked so hard to find. So she was confessing this with embarrassment, shame, etc. We began to try to work on this together. It involved my helping her to reframe stupidity into human vulnerability and legitimizing her vulnerability again as too much of a valuable character trait. The transcendence, which you remember Cloninger talking about during his previous time as a speaker here, and also Annette Mahoney talking about her attempt or concept of sanctifying uh, sacred relationships, theistically or non theistically which you start giving more to, expecting to get more out of, but are a desecration when they are exploitative in nature. We also discussed quite a bit about what she referred to as her very Catholic upbringing, was producing an urge to make what I was pretty sure was going to be a relationship complicating confession about her activities to her new husband. My work with her involved me taking the position that the best is the enemy of the good. Uh, yes, she had made mistakes, but she had also confessed to me before a disaster. We then helped her to remember both the many good aspects of her and her husband's relationship, and also the wisdom of one of my favorite pieces of poetry, Emily Dickinson's advice, to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. The truth must dazzle gradually, lest every man be blind. Uh, earlier in the, the session today, Dr. Graham mentioned the tendency at times of high stress like this to resume or start excessive alcohol use, drug use, et cetera. But in 2020, we also have to be aware of uh, and ask our uh, patients if they are coping by a problematic or complicated or excessive use of social media because the vulnerability here is great and uh, uh, very, very dangerous. 
I want to end my stories about what I've learned in uh, COVID on a uh, positive uh, part of the pandemic. And I'm going to be talking about a different patient who I'm going to call Mr. Jones, a 58-year-old Asian-American uh, accountant, someone who had really excelled in his professional and business life. But he, too, had a similar sort of trait a tendency to what he called rescue stray cats for romantic partners. Uh, and that led to his initial consultation with me also about eight years before the COVID started. Uh, <clears throat> when we were working together, we slowly but recognized that this noble but life uh, complicating tendency arose for him for him from his deep attachment to both his parents, a transferential propensity. His parents had divorced in his late, ten, late teen years when his father could no longer tolerate his mother's severe, debilitating, and never well-treated anxiety disorder. Uh, in the process of our work, uh, Mr. Jones slowly attract, just extracted himself from a marriage to a woman who shared his mother's anxiety symptoms, which were actually a, an attractive element for him. She was a stray cat he might be able to rescue this time. But she did not have his mother's many positive loving traits, and uh, he had really had a wonderful relationship with his mother. So after the divorce, his first few efforts at reconnection also related in some real near disasters with similar stray cats in his language. But he eventually also found a healthy partner, a woman with whom he shared many interests and visions and had a really lovely marriage the last uh, few years of his and my relationship. I was also struck during the time that he became a sort of role model of a divorced father who maintains loving and involved relationships with his children and was not distracted by efforts from his divorced wife to uh, make them choose uh, between the two of them, as so often happens in unhappy divorces. Uh, his two children included one who was quite a academic superstar, and the other, the second child, who was a, a lovely young woman as well, but she had really severe psychological uh, disabilities that required much attention and eventually led to a couple of hospitalizations. So when COVID hit, Mr. Jones, who was very involved in his business world, uh, was confronted with an unwanted and really drastic reduction in work hours, work travel, both for his business and for his uh, national uh, activities and with re related to his business. He really missed the generative activity with his work team. Uh, we were always talking about that before COVID, about how he wanted to help other people succeed and would do whatever was necessary to develop people who would take over major positions in his firm. What he was able to do, however, was to redirect these efforts to extraordinary uh, loving involvement with both his children and his now demented and increasingly frail father in another state who actually lived near my patient's brother. During this time of COVID, I've been really uh, in admiration of many things, extraordinary things that uh, Mr. Jones has done in response to the forced reduction of work hours. But his efforts to create a good death for his father, very unlike the, some of the deaths that both Dr. Pargman and Dr. Graham have referred, in, before, uh, referred to before, earlier, but a good death, not only for his father, his father's second wife, and his siblings. And that'll be my focus in the last few minutes. He and I talked about many phone discussions with his father. When they would talk about 
their shared sports activities, their strikingly similar efforts to succeed not only as individuals in their work life, but also as professional team builders. As his father's death became clearly more imminent, Mr. Jones left his work with the active support of his wife, went to the other state where his father lived, and spent the last two weeks with him and brought together his uh, brother and the sister who lived in a third state. The family with the father's uh, input chose a death at home, not in that horrible isolation of a hospital made worse by COVID, as was discussed earlier. Over the last few days of his father's life, uh, and he reported this when he came back from his father's uh, uh, death, he spent a lot of time talking with his father, whose dementia was profound, but he could be engaged uh, in a meaningful way with telling stories about their shared experiences during my uh, uh, patient's childhood and young adulthood, of his sports activities, his, uh, they played golf together. Uh, he also told him how he had arranged golf lessons for this disabled daughter of his, and they were doing that together to have an activity. And we noticed together how that activity was an internalization of his father's uh, loving generativity that he experienced himself. And he also told stories, and both he and I were impressed as he would tell me more stories about his father as a mentor in his firm, how much uh, my patient had used that as a model for his activity in his own firm. Uh, no death with fragility, dementia, and unexplained pain is either pretty or desirable. But Mr. Jones' presence with his father somewhat countered and maybe just attenuated, but it was meaningful what Dr. Pargment talked about as leaving existence alone and created for them, the two of them together, several of those sacred moments talked about by Dr. Graham and which Dr. Mahoney and he have written about, I think very beautifully, uh, like the story that uh, Ken told about the couple that he found in his group. Uh, his efforts left me with what Ken earlier described as vicarious inspiration. Just like Dr. Smith's story of the exploitation of her love for her husband left me with what Ken referred to as vicarious traumatization and my difficult to contain rage at the exploiter of her wish to express the love for her husband uh, and that she had unfortunately expressed in Facebook and who knows who actually the perpetrator was. So each of us at this conference are participant observers in the emotional turmoil of the COVID plague. We really must be vigilant to attenuate the consequences of threat, ambiguity, and indefiniteness of this horrific scourge. But I hope my little story with Mr. Jones also helps us to be aware of potential opportunities for a new appreciation of neglected aspects of both our patients and ourselves and our relationships and our patients' relationships that might be valuably nurtured if we can face this threat together as a spiritual community and in what Ken and Annette have talked about as seeking the sacred in our calling, our vocation as a calling to serve sacred others. I think I'm going to turn it over now to Cynthia, who will lead a question and answer portion with the time that's left. I think we're actually, unfortunately, we're out of time. And uh, that just is a reflection on um, rich and wonderful learning. So um, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Pargament. Thank you, Dr. Graham, Dr. Lomax, for everyone at ISH.
Baylor and Menninger who helped make this conference an annual event. And we really look forward to your feedback. Thank you so much uh, and have a safe uh, rest of your day and be well. Uh, thank you for joining us. This concludes our programming for today.